Yellowstone supervolcano geyser eggs secret. This is Old Faithful's mysterious eggs and what's going on underneath in Old Faithful's geysers. Secrets of Old Faithful geysers. The eggs of Old Faithful are like geologic gobstoppers in each layer capturing snapshots of past conditions. This is uh, an image by Michael Nichols of National Geographic. Geyserite is a form of opalin silica that's often found around hot springs and geysers. Geyserite is sometimes referred to as sinter. Boreodal geyserite is known as fireite. Now, these geyser eggs don't spawn a swarm of baby steam sputtering structures. They are, after all, just rocks, but they're far from ordinary. These are pebbles, and they're like geologic gobstoppers. They solidify layer by layer because silica from the steamy waters of the geothermal pools precipitate out of the solution. They make each layer a snapshot of, a snapshot of pool conditions at the time it was formed. These geologic mysteries, or these oddities, lie scattered in the colorful thermal pools around Yellowstone's Old Faithful Geyser, but strong protections within the National Park have long prevented scientists from getting their hands on these Old Faithful Geyser eggs. However, recently, for the first time, a team of geologists were allowed to remove a single Old Faithful egg. Their analysis of the bean-shaped pebble, which is roughly the size of a silver dollar, provides new insights into the egg's delicate structure and could provide clues on how Old Faithful changes over time. A study author, Bridget Lynn of the University of Auckland in Australia, says it's amazing to think that these little rocks capture and preserve the history of the discharging fluid as for long as it is growing. The study was conducted in conjunction with the National Geographic funded project. It was focused on teasing out near surface geyser features. Geyser eggs analysis could also hold the secrets to early life. This is what Brian Jones explains. He's a geologist from the University of Alberta, Canada, who was not involved in the study. Some scientists posit that geysers fostered some of the earliest cellular forms, which means studying similar eggs could help researchers untangle how life first arose. These golden eggs. Even though scientists have long known that geyser eggs do exist, they still conceal many questions within their smooth, curvy sides. And why do they form? How quickly do they take shape? What information does each layer hold? Part of the problem is studying geyser eggs is that while geysers and thermal pools they create are rare geological features, geyser eggs are even rarer. This is what Duncan Foley says. He's a study author and the geologist at Pacific Lutheran University. Old Faithful's thermal pools are surprisingly rife with geyser eggs. Quote, this was the largest collection of these rare rocks I have seen in my scientific career, said Lynn. For me, this added a new dimension to the iconic status of Old Faithful Geyser." End quote. The study, to study this precious Yellowstone Old Geyser egg, the researchers sliced it in half. They subjected it to the battery of tests to determine its composition and structure. Among many tests were CT scans, as well as bombarding the internal layers with beams of electrons and x-rays to tease out minute structures and they had found layered details. The egg contained concentric, concentric rings of varying density and composition. He says we're seeing what are probably changes in the chemistry of geyser waters through time. This is what Foley said. A geyser egg grow. The geyser's eggs grow. They're actively recording any shifts in elemental composition, adding that the Changes in density may reflect cyclical changes like the frost and thaw of passing seasons. But what do these changes mean for Old Faithful's plumbing? Well, the answer is complicated. 
The famous geyser's waters collect in a large underground teapot-shaped chamber before periodically erupting, but they first travel through a web of underground crevices. Along the way, the roiling waters, which reach temperatures over 350 degrees Fahrenheit, dissolve the nearby minerals, changing the chemistry of the waters. But how those twists and turns change through time remains a mystery. Jones says it's very difficult to trace that water. Now, what came first, the microbe or the egg? Generally speaking, the process of geyser egg formation is similar to making hard candy, says Foley. Candy makes, makers must heat sugary water to high temperatures, dissolving much more of the sweet stuff, sugar that is, than colder water could handle. Then, as the solution cools, the sugar begins to crystallize. Similarly, thermal pools of geysers are periodically refreshed with hot, mineral-rich water when nearby geysers erupt. And as the solution cools, the minerals may slowly precipitate and cling to whatever is available. And sometimes it takes the forms of eggs. But thermal pools also contain microbes, which could also enhance the growth. Now, how fast the egg forms remains unknown. Unlike the rings of a tree, geyser egg layers probably are not annual, says Jones. His 2001 analysis of trapped pollen grains in New Zealand geyser eggs suggests the egg layers grow at about 0.35 millimeters per year, but it's a mystery whether this holds true for geyser eggs from other regions. With just a sim single sample in the latest study, it's hard to draw many definitive conclusions. Quote, when you only got one of something, you never know if it's typical, Jones says. But he's quick to add, I can't fault the authors for that. They did well to get even one. It was truly a privilege to be allowed access to this site and to be able to sample the geyser eggs, says Lynn. Not only could the new study help preserve the iconic old faithful, it makes one more step, takes one more step towards cracking the geyser eggs' secrets. Now concerning the chamber, the old faithful chamber of this cone geyser, is uh, you know Yellowstone has uh, sixty percent of the world's geysers, about three hundred to five hundred, and ten thousand hydrothermal areas. Not all of these have been mapped by U.S. Geological Survey yet. As we know, Yellowstone National Park has only been established in two thousand one, after the BBC documentary December two thousand motivated the U.S. government to establish the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. Now, what's inside of Old Faithful? Scientists discover a giant kettle that makes Yellowstone's famous geyser blow. This is by Daily Mail. Scientists discovered the previously unknown chamber underneath Yellowstone's Old Faithful that helps explain the mechanisms behind the geyser's eruptions. And since it was discovered over 140 years ago, this geyser has burst forth with amazing regularity, and now new research reveals how an underground cavity filled with steam bubbles help to fuel this massive fountain. Quote, the first model of geysers made by early explorers one century ago showed a cavity, but no one was able to find the cavity or prove that it existed. This is what Jean Van de Mullebroek of Université de Savoie in Le Bourget du Lac in France wrote in a paper about the discovery of the Geophysical Research Letters Journal. And we know that Old Faithful was discovered in 1870, and uh, it's in national, the National Park. It's erupted with amazing regularity, and new research reveals the underground mechanics propelling the outbursts. The massive blasts from geysers occur because hot volcanic rocks heat water underground, and ultimately bringing the water to a boiling point. The new understanding by Professor Van de Mullerbroek shows that what is a separate cavity stores pressurized near-boiling water, steam, and other gases to help that propel Old Faithful's eruption. The cone geyser was first discovered in 1870, 
during the Washburn Langford Doan expedition. It spews out bursts of steam about every 90 minutes, and true to its name, it has erupted more than 100,000 times up to now in its long history. It can vary in height from 106 to 184 feet, and the eruptions typically last between one and a half to five minutes. During the blast, scientists estimate that anywhere from 3,700 gallons to 8,400 gallons of water are released every time. Now, there is an old faithful live stream webcam. Most of the time it's up. There are times where it's not up at all. Um, but sometimes it has lapses or uh, uh, interferences. Uh, and we see that, basically, I've noticed in the past couple of days, and we even see it in Yellowstone Volcano Observatory um, monitoring of the hydrothermal areas, that there is inc an increase of water coming out of uh, Old Faithful, for example. There's an increase of water. And we even see this in the images of Old Faithful, the uh, upper geyser basin, as we see on the map. It has a, a series of geysers to the left of it, uh, as we see in the uh, screen of the live feed camera. And it seems like they're always emitting steam, and to a very great extent. And that's also confirmed by what's shown in Yellowstone Volcano Observatory's monitoring and the graphs the past two, three days. Now, it says here, gas bubbles in the cavity apparently explode as it collide with the roof and walls, generating the small amounts of seismic activity that the research team interpreted to reconstruct the cavity shape and location. This is according to the American Geophysical Union. The scientists say geysers vaporize underground and turn it into steam, which then rises through underground channels towards the surface. Cooler condensed water near the surface blocks steam escape, pushing it back down, creating a pressurized system. Steam from the boiling water produces bubbles underground that accumulate in the subterranean reservoir. It builds up pressure until it can no longer be contained. That pressure pushes the water upward until it spits up from the ground and then bursts into the sky in these magnificent geyser fountains that we see. And now after the geyser erupts, there's a 15-minute recharge period in the case of, for example, Old Faithful, when the water level in the chamber decreases. In the next 15 minutes, the water level begins to rise. Seismic activity increases in preparation for another eruption. Research from the past shows that the moisture levels impact the frequency of the geyser's eruption, as does the seismic activity moving. So moisture levels, when we have more water, more rain, more snow melt, etc., there's more moisture, and it impacts the frequency of the geyser's eruption. The American National Park, Yellowstone, as we know, most of which sits in Wyoming, it also sits in Montana, nearby Idaho, though it also extends Montana, Idaho, is the largest site of geysers. It's a home of about 300 to 500 geysers, which is half of the world's total of about 1,000. Now we know we've had lately a tremendous amount of quake swarms just outside of the boundary of the park. It's in basically the area of Hebgen Lake, where we had the 1959 7.3 magnitude earthquake. And uh, it's around the uh, Madison, and between Madison and Yellowstone rivers that we see all these uh, quake swarms between Old Faithful, northwest of Old Faithful, and towards Manhattan, Montana, and towards Hebgen Lake, where we had the 7.3 magnitude earthquakes. And we have earthquake swarms going on there most of the time, as well as uh, uh, in the, in the uh, park area. And this is Hebgen Lake, that little blue water that you see on the left-hand side, upper left-hand side of the screen. It's just outside of the park boundary, but that's exactly still part of Yellowstone Supervolcano. That's where we had the 7.3 magnitude quake in 1959, and they say that a lot of the biggest quakes that we have here in Yellowstone is basically a, a, a bunch of aftershocks from that quake because it was so big and intense that it shook up the area very well. 
I'll leave links below for you for this. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.